Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Web Platform Podcast. Episode number 167. Today we're talking about the future of PWAs and web components and all things wonderful. We are your host today, Justin Rebro, Amal Hussein, and Danny Blue. Amal, Danny, hello. Hello, hey. Justin. Hey, hey, everyone. Good to see you all on this pleasant Thursday. And before we introduce our guest this week, we're going to throw it over to Leon, who's going to talk about this week in the web in two minutes or less. Leon. Thank you, Justin. This is actually Danny filling in for Leon this week. I will do my absolute best to not make a fool of myself. Site isolation which helps mitigate Spectre is now available in Chrome. For a full scope of, uh, of how the design works, uh, there's a document available for, on the Chromium project page, and we'll put a link to that. TypeScript 3 has been uh, released. It was in RC a few weeks ago. It's uh, officially out now. So there are some, uh, some interesting features and, and options that are, that are now available. Ionic 4 Beta has been released. So there have been a lot of changes coming from the Ionic project for quite a while. Um, a lot to do with, with web components and their tool stencil. So it's exciting to see that finally move on to beta. And something that not directly related, but Slack and Atlassian have announced some sort of partnership. And so I know a lot of us use Slack and uh, many Atlassian products. So it will be interesting to see how that affects um, our work and personal lives going forward. Interesting updates this week, Leon. Thanks for that. And speaking of interesting web things, today our guest is Alex Russell. Alex, thanks for joining us on the show today. Yeah, of course. Glad to be here. So, Alex, you've been around the web for a long time, but for those of, out there who don't know who you are and sort of what you do, uh, how about a little introduction? Hi. Yeah, so um, I'm Alex Russell. I'm a software engineer on the web platform team inside of the Chrome team. Um, and I... <laughs> I design new features for the web, I guess, is the shortest way to say it. Uh, and I have for some time now been leading teams that have been iterating and implementing those designs. And I, I feel like that's uh, it's a very succinct way to say it. But uh, to say that you have been involved, you've been involved in the web for a long time. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think my first you know, sort of standards meeting was probably 2006 or seven. So it's been, it's been a while. <laughs> well, that's great. So I, uh, you know, I always, you know, it's usually I'm the oldest person on the show who has been around in the web and I get made fun of by Ma and Danny and Leon and pretty much everybody else. So it's nice to have someone who's remembers what the web was like in 2006. It's always a pleasant experience. Uh uh, I can't see either oh, one of your faces at oh, all, Danny, but I know you're laughing at me, so it's fine. <laughs> and uh, actually, Alex, it seems like I, I, I was expecting you to say something like, oh, I um, I co-invented the web with Tim Berners-Lee, you know, or something like that. Like, feels like you feels like you've been around forever <laughs> and also, you know, no, 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 not in like this are not aging re either. It's like, you know, it's stuck in time, uh, Alex. <laughs> Yeah, maybe you're just from the future, just like, you know. <laughs> the great beard I've got going on. <laughs> and that's why I'm angry. <laughs> so when it comes to spec-oriented things, what was sort of the first spec you worked on? What was, the, you know, sort of your introduction to, wow, I'm going to try to make the world a better place? So I used to um, uh, lead a, a project building a JavaScript toolkit before that was a cool thing to do. And uh, Brendan Ike at some point invited me to participate in TC39. And so this was in the ES4 days. Uh, I don't know if you remember any of that, but that was a, that was a total cluster. Um, it, was, it was a huge eye-opener about how standards get made and how the process actually works. Um, I'm not sure I learned all the right lessons, <laughs> at least certainly not up front, but um, it was uh, an opportunity to help shape the future of a platform that I was already heavily invested in, right? Because it was my, my living, my day job to make tools to help our developers make apps. And so, um, you know, you sort of get introduced uh, from sort of a, uh, uh, it's like it's like a going through a gear shift 
where you start, you know, at a very high rate of uh, uh, rate of change or, or cycle rate um, to moving sort of one step in, which has higher gearing, right? You just say you've got more power per turn, but things move much more slowly. And so that's a, that's a really interesting shift. And uh, by 2009, eight, late 2008, early 2009, um, I had decided to kind of take that all the way and, and come work on a browser directly. And, and so what was that transition like for you, uh, you know, shifting from being, you know, this web developer or, you know, uh, engineer that's really not working on the platform, maybe building tools for uh, using the platform uh, to, to then shifting uh, to working on the platform. It was mostly an act of desperation, if I'm honest. <laughs> um, the, I, I started doing web development in the late 90s and early 2000s, and when I started on the web, we were replacing the dominant browser once every couple of years. So you went from having Netscape Navigator 3.2 Gold being the thing that quote unquote everybody was using to Netscape 4 being the thing that everybody was using to IE4 being the thing that everyone was using and then IE5 and then 5.5 and then 6. Um, and then at the end of the IE6 experience, Microsoft had so thoroughly won the browser war that they disbanded the IE team. And what happened was that the ecosystem basically stopped moving. We didn't get anything new for something like four or five years when previously the iteration cycle was so high that we had web developers saying, oh my goodness, please save me from the 5.0 browsers. These 4.0 browsers are so much different than the 3.0 browsers. It's going to be insane if we get a 6.0 browser. Um, so we got sort of manna from heaven all the time, if you will, and that stopped. And so JavaScript libraries were kind of the one way that we could fill in some of those capability gaps. Obviously, we couldn't add fundamental new capabilities, but we could definitely paper over a bunch of the problems and sort of upgrade the level of um, sophistication that we were developing at. And so working on a JavaScript library was a, sort of an act of desperation, right? You, you couldn't just use HTML and CSS to get everything you needed to done, especially not for ambitious applications. And so uh, invested a lot in that because you wanted to deliver a great user experience. And then uh, when it became very clear that the browsers weren't moving at all um, and that no matter how good Firefox was, it was going to have a very difficult time replacing uh, IE use, especially in enterprise scenarios, um, I went to Google because there was a project starting called Chrome Frame. And Chrome Frame was an idea that had been bouncing around. Uh, lots of folks have been working on something like it. Uh, Mozilla had a Gecko embedding project that wasn't super different. Brad Newberg had been talking about, you know, what if we could make a plugin to embed WebKit? Uh, and then, you know, when I heard from uh, friends at Google that they were going to do this, it was an opportunity uh, that I couldn't pass up. So um, I... Uh, I uh, went back in for interviews, which was difficult because <laughs> uh, I don't have a degree of any sort. And then um, to my surprise, they hired me and I've been working on a browser ever since. I, I think that's really interesting. And I'm especially for that time period, um, which I do always find fascinating it too, as Justin points out, like I believe like in 2000, I believe I was in sixth grade or something like that. So like, I don't, I don't even, I don't even think I had the internet of any sort at that point. I am curious if there were any, like any dramatic sudden realizations going from working on a, uh, a JavaScript framework or utilities or something like that to working on the browser. Like, were there any sudden, Oh my goodness, we shouldn't have been doing something this way or was it more the other way of I know I now know what developers want and I can help drive that uh, at the platform level? I think there's a little of each there. I wouldn't say anything was sudden. I make all of my mistakes the hard and slow way. So <laughs> um, to the extent that I learned things, it's been uh, by beating my head against a particular wall long enough to make a dent. The, the set of things that really became apparent from inside the browser engine were the extent to which I didn't know what I was doing before. <laughs> um, and so I, 
I don't give a lot of talks anymore, but I try to make sure that when I'm sort of trying to explain, you know, new pieces of the platform, uh, it comes from a perspective of trying to inform about what the browser is actually doing on your behalf and not doing because the costs don't make sense, right? The web is not like a C-based platform. So if you start uh, from assembler, you can get to C. And if you get from C, you can get like in a Unix environment, you can get to a user space that has graphics and you can do all this other stuff, but it all makes sense at every layer down the stack, right? You can describe everything else that's happening in the system in terms of the layer below you, which uh, is a natural you know, transition from one phase to the other. Whereas on the web, we started at a super high level. CSS and HTML are extraordinarily high level and there's no C underneath them. So the set of things that are cheap versus the set of, of things that are expensive kind of defy expectations. They, they, there's no easy intuitive way to describe which things cost a lot and which that, things don't. That's a fascinating point. Um, it's also important to note that there's also a lot of inefficiencies in the implementations of these uh, primitives that cause, I think, uh, unexpected performance, uh, uh, poor, unexpected poor performance. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, and I'd say that that's exacerbated by the web's strength, which is portability, right? So it's not just that something is potentially slow in one engine, it's that it might be slow in one popular or important engine, but fast everywhere else, but that might still hamstring you. So web development for as long as I've been doing it has been about this sort of triangulation where you have to pay attention to everything, quote unquote, that has more than 10% market share, depending on what your market is, and uh, try to gracefully degrade for things below that. And, and that 10% that threshold, you know, admits some really crazy stuff sometimes. So, you know, in some markets, that's an ancient browser. In some markets, that's a relatively new browser that doesn't happen to implement something good. Uh, or it might have a different set of optimizations, right? There was this long transition period between, um, you know, Chrome and Firefox uh, and Safari getting JITs and IE7 finally leaving the ecosystem or IE8 actually, IE9 was the first with a JIT. So, you know, even that JavaScript performance thing, which now is like a very smooth uh, up into the right curve has this story behind it where there are these very large non-linearities and um, the rate at which the, the old stuff cycles out of the ecosystem matters quite a lot. It's the key determinant of like your ability to use a new feature. So I, I'm actually curious about that as well with the the way that you just described certain browsers, and it doesn't matter which one it is in this particular case, but you have a browser that implements something sometimes poorly, or they have a browser that's optimized for, uh, for something else. Um, I'm curious what some of the decision-making is like when shipping a feature, uh, when what whatever it is, whether it's a new, you know, if it's a new print primitive or an optimization to the way the browser does something, how do people or how do the, the the browser vendors help decide this is important, this needs to be as performant as possible, or performant as possible, or something else maybe isn't as important? Yeah. So there's a there's a nasty, dirty secret about the browser ecosystem, which is the browser engineers are humans. Um and the second nasty, dirty secret is that uh, browser engineers are not web developers. So if you add those two things up, what you get is a situation where browser engineers always want to do the right thing. They are acting with relatively limited information compared to um, what a web developer needs. You know, I always joke that you, uh, you don't pass the, the boss at the end of the web development level and suddenly get handed a Clang compiler, uh, Chromium checkout and, you know, a copy of uh, Goma. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you don't you don't start suddenly uh, writing in C++ when you were previously a JavaScript expert. So they are distinct skills. And that means that bridging that information gap between the two communities is really important and unfortunately rare. So we have some tools which help express the needs of developers. And I think those have gotten significantly better 
than they were even five years ago. Um, a, a few of them uh, come to mind. Obviously, benchmarks are, are one that we hear a lot about. Benchmarks, when they're done well, encode the most important use cases, and they give developers a number to go crank, right? You know, being slower than the competition is what gets a browser engineer out of bed in the morning. And so um, to the extent that something can be encoded in a benchmark, that's a really impactful way to cause the entire ecosystem to change. At the same time, benchmarks that are poorly targeted or target sort of out of date goals uh, can be a huge drag on the overall ecosystem, if that makes sense. Like you can spend the same amount of engineering time working against your ecosystem as you do for it, shipping something that's quote unquote faster, but it, it might not actually change real world outcomes. So one of the big changes that we've had in thinking inside the web platform team at Chrome has been uh, based on our ability to gather evidence. So we have uh, an increasingly sophisticated set of tools for getting telemetry from the field. If you've seen or heard about the Chrome user experience report, these are tools that are helping us understand what users are actually experiencing in the field in a way that is attributed by origin, which is something that we never had before. So this is um, this is a, a kind of a sea change for us. And I know that the Edge team has um, really great telemetry as well, and, and they're using that to help inform their decision making. So that's that's sort of the optimization side of it. When it comes to new features, that's still an area where I think we are not as data driven as we could or maybe should be. Uh, and so almost all new feature work happens as a result of some combination of developer web developer advocacy to us, as well as uh, a, uh, a process of exploration to try to understand whether or not something is really common. Uh, is it so common that it actually needs support in the platform? Because you know we have to acknowledge that we have relatively limited resources inside the um, browser teams. You know there are hundreds of browser engineers serving millions of web developers. And so using those resources well is, uh, is a really important, um, it's a really important challenge. So getting better data, uh, having a deliberative process, working in public to make sure that we're designing the right thing uh, and engaging with the community uh, to the greatest extent that we can in the feature design process, uh, and then eventually in the standardization process. Those are important, um, aspects of making sure that we ship the right thing. And I can talk all day about that, uh, although I, I will plug my blog because I recently, recently wrote a, a whole uh, uh, two-part series about what it is like to try to make progress on the platform and how standards fit into that equation and, and you know our work in the last three or four years about trying to separate design of new features from their standardization. Uh, my blog is uh, infrequently.org in case that helps you find it. <laughs> yeah, and, and we'll definitely link to the, your blog in, the, in our show notes. Um, uh, that, that's a really fascinating answer, Alex. Uh, I think you highlighted for me a couple of important things, which is A, like the disconnect between these two different worlds, uh, which are you know, these two different ecosystems, I think, which live in the same world, right? So we have the platform browser engineer land, and then we have web developer land, you know, and they're two sides of the, of the same fence, uh, but so, you know, vastly different in their approach to problem solving thinking. And, and I, as a web developer, I have to say that, like, I am, it never, web developers never stop amazing me in, like, their ingenious and creativity and ability to problem solve, you know, it really just, like, some of the smartest people on, on earth, in, in my opinion, my, my very biased opinion. Uh, it, but having uh, kind of shifted uh, gears a little more recently to working on platforms and being exposed uh, to, to that world now through my work at, at Boku, um, it's it's kind of, it's still shocking how, just how much of a disconnect there really is between these two worlds. You know, uh, just, you know, web developer needs versus like, uh, you know, platform or browser engineer context, you know, there's a huge disconnect. Um, and uh, I, I really think that both communities could do better, you know, if they were less uh, disconnected. Uh, but more importantly, like there, there's a very key area, I think, of, of the two communities that where they kind of meet. And for me, that's inside of the dev tools, you know, and so the folks working on dev tools, especially like 
Chrome DevTools, Firefox uh, DevTools, there's there's a there's a um, you know that that's kind of like the web developer home, right? And there's such good, I think, user experience there, and in such keen awareness to like what the web developer needs to solve his or her problem. That like I, I know that there are people within the you know platform land that like understand the needs of de- these you know developers well, and so. I, I'm wondering, can we just take all of the dev tool engineers and just like clone them <laughs> like and 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 kind of provide that uh, like do 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 some knowledge transfer and sharing? Uh, you know, I guess yeah. in which direction <laughs> both, both, I think, really. I think I think both ways, right? I think there's web developers can can learn a ton. and I, I think you know browser engineers can learn a ton as well, yeah, i will I will. Uh echo your sentiment that browser engineers can learn a ton. It, there's a, it, it is a constant challenge to help browser engineers really come to grips with the challenges that web developers are facing. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, we're, we're doing better on the Chrome team of late. We, you know, we are more engaged with customers and with partners. Um, I'd say that uh, part of our goal in designing new features at least has been to move that design phase to places where web developers can participate uh, but the, the feedback about DevTools is is really interesting. I, I know that the DevTools team, um, they've recently started, uh, again, updating their documentation and making sure that, that people can you know, navigate their extraordinarily powerful interface. Uh, and it never ceases to amaze me um, how much DevTools can do if you just know where to look. Uh, it, it's a, it's a tr- I, if I'd had it when I was starting, <laughs> I may never have stopped being a web developer. It's so good. Yeah, no, it, it, it really is. Um, you know, but I guess, and the, I think that the, the positive, the positive story is that I think, um, you know, I, I, I that we're for, fortunate to be like in a time where, you know, all of these browser engines are competing for speed, security, user experience, and, and now developer experience, right? And we have this new developer uh, dev tool protocol, which, you know, uh, the edge team is, is implementing as well. Um, and, you know, where I expect to see a, a lot more, you know, uh, just uh, an improvement in usability um, and accessibility in the DevTool uh, space. So that that's great. Uh, I'm really excited about that. And I think, you know, the Chrome team I, helped lead that initiative, if I'm correct. Yeah, and Pavel, Pavel Feldman and his team have done an extraordinary job. Uh, I will also echo though that the gap is large between what dev tools can show you today and what we see from the true internals. So if you're in Chrome and you would like to see what a browser engineer sees about Chrome, there is a tool built into every version of Chrome. You can go to Chrome colon tracing. And if you go to Chrome colon tracing, this is sort of the X-ray system that we use to inspect how it's working. Uh, you might want to do this on like a side-by-side install, like your canary or something, because it, it can be very noisy. Um, and it'll ask you sort of which, you can record a trace and you can it'll ask you which thing you want to see. And it will show you every thread of every process if you ask it to. And it will dig, dig really deep into all of those things. And so things that are hidden from you in DevTools are, for instance, the number of IPC hops between processes in order to make a particular thing actually happen in the background. Um, and so... Those are the sorts of things where explaining how the system actually works would maybe help folks who are at the very, you know, tough end or the high end of their um, performance or development analysis process, where they they kind of have gotten as far as they can with the other tools and, and maybe this other thing. But but it's, it is still a very large gap between what um, the browser tells you in dev tools and what the browser actually knows about how things are going. So. Um, there's a constant struggle to make that kind of feedback actionable. I think that's a constant problem as a whole for the platform though, right? Is that how can we make things that are actionable from a developer experience and yet still somewhat yeah. accessible to people who still want to come onto the platform and build things? Because there is that there's that gap now, right? With the way tooling, because tracing is probably my favorite part of Chrome. Um, for those who have not tried played with it, it gives you a lot of information and you can take actionable steps out of it, but that is definitely yeah. not, I would never like start a, somewhere uh, there. A stop on the tour, <laughs> not a, you know, <laughs> that's, <laughs> but it, yeah, exactly. 
but as you as you start to build those APIs, you know, at the internal level that need to be surfaced out to a developer, and we've had this conversation over the years about, you know, where 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 is that line? Where is that line from a standards perspective? of we need this so the platform can move forward, but also from a browser engineer perspective, well, how am I going to implement this so somebody can use it to an end developer who might be using DevTools or some other tooling going, I actually need to now use this and trace this so that I can make something performant. There is quite a large gap there still um, from the entire process. And it's very hard to bridge, uh, which I suspect you see on a quite a daily basis when you're dealing with. Yeah. And I think you're you're touching on something that's kind of near and dear to my interest, which is the idea of, extensibility or returning the power the browsers have historically reserved for themselves to developers to allow them to do a better job for users, right? So um, efforts like web components and service workers and the Houdini work, uh, these are all efforts that are designed to let you run code in parts of the platform where we were already running code. We were already dishing out work to uh, a separate network thread, but you couldn't run any code there. You were already, um, managing this entire life cycle of a whole series of components and their internals, but we didn't let you participate with your own components. Uh, we didn't let you, we were already doing this whole complicated dance about layout and paint and rasterization, but we didn't expose any of those details to you except through this very flat surface of uh, CSS syntax, which honestly is perhaps the single most confusing place to add <laughs> um, uh, a way to control both layout and fonts and rasterization control. So it's, um. It's this process of breaking up the monopoly that browser engines have historically had on these pieces of the page and its lifecycle and the implementation below it and giving you control over them in a way that is more natural, right? That doesn't sort of camp everything out in a single thread through a single interface that lets you break it up, break up your work the same way that we've broken up ours, right? Web audio, for instance, now with audio worklet runs code nearer to the thread that actually does the audio processing than before when it happened to live on the main thread. So this process of you know, democratizing the work so that you can run your code where it makes sense uh, is, an ongoing, is an ongoing thing. And that creates a real balance issue, right? Like we can say pretty clearly that um, we have uh, created a huge amounts of power on the main thread and uh, for JavaScript developers and that that's not going well. We you know like this is something I struggle with every day. I feel a little bit guilty, right? We've we've opened up huge amounts of capability. And what we're seeing now is uh, many, many sites and uh, teams inadvertently destroying the experience for their users using these tools that we've handed them. Yeah, this is it's such a great segue, Alex, I think, into, uh, you know, some topics that we were uh looking to dive in with uh on and today you know the extensible web all these new awesome primitives that were exposed uh to i have to say the javascript story um i blame bundlers you know <laughs> you're blaming uh browsers for for optimizing <laughs> i i blame bundlers because i think they made made it so easy and invisible to just like you know install and just like boom, 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 like, you know, before you know it, you're shipping, like, you know, all this stuff over the wire. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, but, but that's just my opinion. I, guess. Yeah, I kind of don't want to blame anyone for anything. <laughs> I, I feel it's maybe it's a little bit more productive to, to say that, you know, one of the areas for improvement in our tools is to try to communicate more clearly whether or not the browser would think of your thing as being a good experience on average. So that's a place where I would suggest that we are not communicating clearly enough to developers about how it's going. You know, I I I always joke that uh, if you're on Chrome for Android or for iOS, we should just stop the page load when you want to load a script that doesn't have a a content length or is more than say 500k in length, Uh, because that's just going to be a bad experience every single time. So why should we why should we ask the user to uh, to persist in a moment that we know is going to be bad? So we've got some responsibility here and and some things to fix. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, too, because I believe in Chrome, I think it's behind a flag right now, is uh, capped warning. <laughs> yes. uh, I think that's in the tree, and I think it's in Canary, which will give you the, you know, oh, hey, by the way, this thing you're about to look at, it's really big. You don't want to look at it, <laughs> which I think is an interesting experience, particularly pe- for people on, uh, d- you know, who are on data, you know, plans. They're like, oh, I need to 
watch what I'm using. I think that's, you know, but but again, it's backwards, right? We're, we're warning the end user about this problem when developers should be saying, oh, hey, right. and so maybe I should ship How do we make the market? How do we tell the developers how it's really going from the field? Because the data, they don't get that data. You have to go add more JavaScript to your page to instrument your site to get some uh, real user metrics and analytics. And so you don't, like, you don't really see a hysteresis effect, even if you've got one. So that is to say, let's say you're shipping two megabytes of JavaScript down the wire, which today is actually not the unusual. And if you're doing that, uh, there are a bunch of users who are just going to bounce off of your site. Will your analytics show it? Well, you got to be looking really closely to see it. So there are a lot of folks who don't even have a sense for how much better it could be going. Um, and I got to tell you, I don't know of any site that's actually running an ablation study that isn't, you know, Google or Facebook. <laughs> um, almost nobody has a discipline to sit down and go, well, if we add another 100 kilobytes of JavaScript, how, how much money does that lose us? And so as a result, uh, I think our developer community isn't getting the kind of feedback that would be helpful. You know, you were talking about that prompt that we're potentially going to show users on slow links. And I think um, what I've advocated for in this design is a button that says report this site. Right? There should be something that, that pings back to, for instance, webmaster tools or the Chrome user experience report, or even the reporting API that says the user thought this was really slow um, so that you can actually get that kind of information in a place that you might already be looking at. And I think that would be very valuable. Yeah. Well, so I, 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 I think that's exciting that the, the, the Chrome team is, is doing that. Uh, but I don't know if it really kind of gets to the root underlying cause here, which I think is like twofold. You know, one is an education problem within within the developer community, right? Uh, around like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and you know how to how to use them effectively. Uh, and and the second thing is also, you know, um, I think just that it's it's so easy to just uh, at this point, like I don't know, it, like every single. Um, uh, like package is so easy to install. I don't know if folks are really, but we don't have a culture of um, of really questioning, uh, you know, third party libs or you know, or, or packages or, or or bundles that we're adding, right? So there's, I mean, there's some, I think some like major shifts in our thinking that need to happen as as a web de developer community. Um, and I and I think you're right that like working with uh, with the platform and and and, and browser engineers in in kind of um, creating those like standards and best practices is really like, I think, uh, I think the, the way forward. And, and my question here is always, you know, I spend a lot of time with partners and with businesses who are trying to build, you know, successful uh, ways to make money on the web. And one of the questions that I always try to keep in the back of my mind is what is going to cause them to change their behavior, right? What is the set of things that will, enlighten them or give them the insight that they need to want to affect that change. Because I don't think anybody shows up to work every day going, I want to do a bad job, right? I, you know, I want to participate in the destruction of the web as an ecosystem for mobile users. I don't think anybody says that out loud. No one tries to do that. Instead, everyone's trying to get through the day um, and use tools that, uh, and produce tools that help everyone, including themselves, do a good job as best they can. And the reasons that we're failing to do it, I think, come down to visibility and actionability. So the fact that these sorts of costs are hidden, that they're invisible, I kind of think of this very much like the environmental crisis that we're facing with global warming, where JavaScript is kind of the CO2 of the, of the web. You can't see it, you need some of it, and too much of it by even a little bit can really screw things up. And so we're in a situation today where um, our tools aren't sort of you know, blaring red, there's no klaxons going off when it is going badly. And so people who are looking at the tools don't get that actionability. And at the same time, the businesses only see these costs in the rear view mirror. So you have to have launched something that's potentially fatal to your business in order to be able to see how bad it can really be. <laughs> and so it's unfortunate that we have so many uh, very, even very high profile, um, uh, high, um, in some cases, High GDP equivalent uh, businesses really hurting themselves with JavaScript as a result of the bloat that comes from these what appear to be cheap decisions that you're that you're um, you're describing. But I think that if we had more actionability and visibility, uh, it would be clear to developers that you know the the constraints are different, and I think the entire ecosystem would would have uh, the same sort of arms race that we've got now about developer experience, about user experience. 
So I'm I'm curious if do you, I'm curious if you think we're we are at least trying to go in the right direction. I, I'm thinking about tools like Lighthouse that exist that maybe aren't the 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 silver bullet solution, but do give developers something. They do give you something right out of the bat that you know it just gives you a number, and that's easy to grok. It's easy to grok. The number I want to be as for performance, I want to be as close to 100 as possible. Um, so are tools like that helping helping to move in the right direction? Or do you still think there's a lot more that needs to be done? Yeah, I think those tools like Lighthouse are, are can be transformative. Uh, the thing that worries me today uh, is that it requires a lot of organizational discipline to prioritize that. You have to really care about those results and in a moderate to large team, you have to have someone uh, who is enough of a product owner who is prioritizing that and not just an individual engineer somewhere on the team getting frustrated because they can't change it uh, in order to affect that kind of change. So there's something here about making this all digestible and visible to business and product owners and then helping folks uh, prioritize that in a way that they can connect with their own success. I think the speed update from search is a, is a good um contribution here. It's going to help focus folks back on the question about whether or not they're actually doing well. And tools like Lighthouse and tools like, you know, so so much of the JavaScript ecosystem adopting things that like, you know, optional code splitting, that kind of thing. The tools have never been better, but our results aren't improving yet. So what's the missing bit of information? How can we connect the people who need it to the data? And so, so Alex, I, I, I completely agree with, with all of your, your sentiments here. And uh, for me, I think it's the, the the rapid shift to mobile. You know, I feel like we we kind of didn't really catch up with um, how do we fully architect our, our 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 applications, right? And so, how do we now update our like um, our, our web app web app architecture? How much we're shipping um, to to really work for these tiny little devices, right? They work great for desktop, uh, not so much for mobile. And so, I think um, you know. The, the Google Chrome team has taken this strong kind of um, initiative with uh, putting together this manifesto for how to best build for mobile web, you know, so the, the progressive web apps. And so uh, can you just tell us a little bit about that and, um, and I guess, uh, and, and your involvement in that, uh, in that uh, manifesto? Yeah, sure. So um, I have helped design and build a lot of the technology that underpins progressive web apps. And with Francis Berman, my partner, we named them back in 2015 after we kept having to say installable web apps and then explain it, you know, with like 30 or 40 seconds of filler. Uh, <laughs> it's the left people confused until you showed them what it was. Um, so we, we sort of launched the technology, uh, built it, launched it, and then named it in part because we want the web to be competitive on mobile, because I think that's a really great fit for those users. For most users of mobile devices, which is to say people who aren't in wealthy Western countries, most of our users on Chrome uh, for Android are not in wealthy Western countries. And what that means is that our users are on Android devices that are probably low on storage and don't have very much memory and have old or slow CPUs. And so making the web work well for them uh, really is key in completing this idea of the web being a, a good alternative to very bloated, very large Android applications, which you can only afford maybe a few of, or are constantly asking you to update out of band or, or potentially are security problems. So the web has a lot of compelling attributes in these markets. It has a lot of potential benefits to these users, but those benefits don't show up if we've got a very slow loading experience in the way. So, so this is all about making sure that while we've added a bunch of new things that would let you deliver really great experiences, that we actually convert on that, that we actually get to a place where the web uh, can be a meaningful part of the lives of uh, the next billion folks who pick up a, a, a new computing device, which is probably going to be a cheap Android. And, and, so, and so with that said, I think we've, we've seen a lot of success in the West and, and, and uh, abroad, uh, like just all over the world with, with adoption of progressive web apps. Um, I, I even actually, I have a progressive web app on my phone right now. That's the, um, I think the uh, governor or the mayor of a city in India, I believe that like has uh, like created like their site and oh, as a progressive the, web app. The prime minister? Prime minister, sorry, sorry. I, I can't remember if he was a governor or not, but the PM of India. Uh, 
made it a made his personal website uh you know a progressive web app like how awesome is that it actually kind of uh, offline too it was, it was pretty cool. yeah no it's it's pretty pretty neat so so what what does i mean like if you could kind of crystal ball like the future uh for us here in the, you know the last few minutes um of our show wh- where do you see um you know the web future uh in terms of uh, progressive web apps so the web's future is is kind of uh, a pun on the web's past, which is to say the web is the single most prevalent, most broadly distributed, most accessible platform uh, across computing devices and time uh, that the world has ever known. And that has been, that portability enables it. Uh, and that creates a huge uh, market for developers to deliver their experiences into and uh, at a lower cost of development and, and distribution. So. Uh, the challenge now is to make sure that we can actually address these next devices, that we can address these next form factors, so that the web's promise of extraordinarily broad distribution uh, can can be something that we convert on. So, um, you know, all of these challenges that we're talking about with performance and you know integration into the system, uh, deep integration, things like push notifications or being on the home screen, these are all pieces of being a credible part of that computing experience for those users. And so we're just going to keep doing that. You know, it's funny, we started Progress Web Apps on mobile. The, the project started in 2013, 2014, uh, and we had every intention of bringing it to desktop. And we're really, you know, Microsoft has beat us to the punch there. Samsung has beat us, uh, has beat the Chrome team by launching desktop Progress Web Apps. Uh, but we're, we're going to be bringing those to desktop this year uh, in Chrome. And uh, I'm optimistic that, uh, you know, if we can make the web work really, really well on mobile for these users, that we'll be able to be part of whatever the next form factor shift is too. You know, the web might become largely driven by voice or it might become largely um, used through, uh, you know, non-traditional uh, computing devices. And, and those experiences will only include the web if the web is a large enough part of people's day-to-day computing such that it makes sense to include it in that next form factor shift too. So, so that's the that's the game. That's what we're playing for, and that's what we're focusing our effort on. Well, we're just up about just about up against time, Alex. If people want to find you online, where about would they find you? So, I'm on Twitter at slightly late. Um, although I should warn you that that's probably got uh, more of a dose of, of politics than, than you might prefer. Um, my blog is more technical. It's at infrequently.org. And uh, you can feel free to email me at slightlyoff at google.com. But I will warn you that my email inbox is a bit of a disaster. So if you don't hear from me the first time, ping me a second time. I feel like a bunch of our users just now, after hearing your, uh, your Twitter handle, just went, oh, that's who it is. <laughs> that asshole. Hey, and, and speaking of politics, I definitely blame bundlers for all of our problems on this show, so it's okay. <laughs> like, I, I think I think they can your, your Twitter your uh, your your Twitter rants are like all in good spirit. Like, yeah, you know what uh, I didn't blame you in that. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, fantastic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode number one hundred and sixty-seven of the Web Platform Podcast. Today, we've spoken with Alex Russell. We've talked about web standards. We've talked about the future of just where your PWA may go and all things that come with browser engineering. Tune in next week when we learn more things web, more things browser, and hey, maybe you'll build something cool. Thanks a lot and have a great rest of your week. Bye, everybody.